It was World Ovarian Cancer Day and there was nothing happening. So I decided, let's make some news. That's all the twirls ready. I took the idea of breast cancer survivors and ovarian cancer sufferers actually getting together to do a march in Newcastle. We got dresses made. Pink represents breast cancer. Teal represents ovarian. I mean, it's not high fashion. <laughs> it's more about the idea, isn't it? <laughs> it's enough to make people think. Yeah, that's what we Question need. Question, That's what we need, yeah. Pink meets teal was a brilliant idea of Jill's. I think it'll look amazing with 30 of us. I felt really proud of Jill when she put those two together and then spoke about that publicly. What do we want? Funding fairness! And when do we want it? Now! Jill was always a little bit of an activist. When do we want it? Now! Somebody who would see a wrong and try to rally people around to try and right it. The governments need to know that women want better than what we've got today with ovarian cancer. It's just Jill has been tenacious. She has had her voice heard. Um, she was not going to go down without a fight and she's going to make a difference for generations to come. What I want to get out of this meeting with the Minister is whether there is any way of redressing the funding inequity. Don't know whether he's going to come at that, but anyway, what have I got to lose? Jill found herself in this situation and thought, I can stay quiet or I can go loud and I can go big and I can go with a bang. And that's what she's chosen to do. Hi. Hello, Minister. Thank you so much for your time today. No, it's an absolute privilege. Thank uh, you. With ovarian cancer, women like me literally don't live long enough to form the army of advocates. Women feel really isolated and lonely and there's this sort of veil of embarrassment. So, Minister, I'm making a podcast where I am both journalist and talent. I need to be a voice. I couldn't sleep well at night knowing that I didn't use what I could to tell the story of this cancer and its gross inequity in the world of cancers. What about, say, some affirmative action funding for ovarian cancer? It's globally been one of these challenges where we haven't made the progress in survival rates. I think her campaign has hit a nerve politically. A global phenomenon. If it improves and there is more money thrown at ovarian cancer, I reckon you can thank Jill Emerson for that. Since I got cancer, I have found great physical and emotional relief in the ocean. I've always been drawn to the water. Since I was a kid, I've loved it. I grew up in suburban Sydney. My parents got divorced when I was a little girl. We were a real working class family. It had been controversial for my mum to get married to my dad, given that he was a Pacific Islander, and my mum was Irish Catholic. My beautiful grandmother, who ended up raising us with mum, I understand later that she was very concerned about having these brown-skinned babies. Jill is the darkest of the children. She did suffer prejudice, but it propelled her to stand up for issues for people who are misunderstood strongly. I remember as a kid sitting in the bath trying to pumice my skin to make it go away because I didn't like it. 
probably wasn't until I was a teenager and cracking a tan was a bit of a thing that I felt it was more of an asset than a disadvantage. I met Jill at school. Jill was a bit of a rebel. She was always looking at issues and wanting people to rally around something. She hated injustice. It was always really clear that she would be active in that space, fighting for the things that she wanted to fight for. So it didn't surprise me at all when she ended up working at Greenpeace. And journalism didn't surprise me either. That led to volunteering work in public radio, which led to work in the newsroom at Triple J. Back then, you got two days a week work in the newsroom for 75 bucks a day. From Triple J, I was lucky and landed a TV job at the science show called Quantum. Hello and welcome to the show. While some say the answer to cancer treatment lies in stronger and more deadly drugs, latest research indicates that... A I way knew nothing about drugs... science, but that didn't seem to matter. It was just about the ability to ask good questions. I didn't really meet my father properly till I was 13. Once I'd been to the islands, I got a love for it. My dad was actually working in Tonga, so... I spent quite a bit of time getting to know him better, getting to know my other relatives there. It was quite, I mean, phenomenal when you see people that you look like, when you'd grown up not looking like anybody in the classroom. After then, I started making radio programs in the Pacific. She was very involved in the nuclear free and independent Pacific. So she was not only a career person, she was an activist. In my mid-30s, I met the Samoan broadcaster at SBS, Ioani Lafua'i. We had a beautiful daughter together. Oh, Malia, that's your Uncle christening. Ted. It was a precious day. It was yeah. such a precious day. She fostered a very supportive relationship between myself and my father, even after their separation, which happened very early in my life. There's the pastor, he's Samoan, speaking in Samoan. She was never a traditional mother. Mum was a bit more radical than me, though, when she was a young one, so I've had to introduce her to makeup and styling <laughs> over the past few years, but to cross, I'm happy to bear. I like that. Malia was the very centre of Jill's life <laughs> and has been ever since. In the summer of 2016, I was feeling pretty good about life. I had my own radio show again after 20 years absence in Newcastle. I'd met a gorgeous bloke. He was a doctor. His name's Ken. And I'd been on my own for a long time, so it was extra good. Jill had some very minor symptoms, and it's things that, as her partner and also as her GP, I didn't, didn't really click as being anything serious. The first thing that made me go to the doctor was the repeat of a deep sensation within my vagina, a dragging sensation that then evolved into a bit of a, a sensation like an electric sort of twinge. I did a transvaginal ultrasound. I remember almost missing that appointment because I was busy at work. The radiologist said, have you got an appointment, a follow-up appointment with your doctor? I said, nah. She said, I would if I were you. And I knew then that it was trouble. The specialist confirmed straight away that the blood test suggested very strongly that I would have ovarian cancer. When I met up with Jill, we walked across the road in front of the specialist's rooms to a park. When she told me, I was stunned and it was devastating. 
As a practitioner, I had um, come across a lot of people with cancer. That's part of my work as a GP. But personally, it was like, oh my God. I remember I threw my handbag at Ken because I didn't think that his emotional response was the response that I needed. And I think I threw it at him to make him angry so he would be as angry as me. Jill found out very quickly that ovarian cancer was a women's cancer that was terribly neglected in its funding, historically and also up into the present. They were using treatments that had been developed 30 or 40 years ago. I'll have a little drink before I go. The only way they can confirm ovarian cancer Come on, buddy. is to cut you open, have a look inside. In the old days, they used to call it peak and shriek. She'd had a very big operation, removing the uterus, fallopian tubes, ovaries. It's already tough surgery. Morning, Ken. Good morning. We've just hooked up your IV, and then we're going to get your chemotherapy regime started. Then they hit you with the toughest chemotherapy that they can. Today, I get my chemo straight into the port, which is in my abdomen, uh, runs through my stomach lining, and it can make you really sick. So um, bring on the big guns. By the time I had my cancer diagnosis, I had stage three ovarian cancer. It's just starting to get down the line now. The best description I heard from one of the surgeons is that ovarian cancer looks like grains of sand. It just spreads like tiny little specks all over all the organs and everywhere. Okay, I'm happy with that. Have you ever tried to sweep up sand or vacuum sand out of your car? Now we're at the end of the first big chapter. Feel feel good. Ovarian cancer is known as the silent killer because the symptoms that you get with it, bloated tummy, changed bowel habits, a bit of back pain, that kind of thing, are all symptoms that many women are familiar with. And this is one of the challenges of this disease is that early diagnosis um, is so difficult. Each year, you know, in Australia, we know that there's about 1,500 women diagnosed with ovarian cancer and about 1,000 women die. My last patch coming off my chemo port. Ta-ta, au revoir, adieu. Arrivederci, Rama. I was pretty devastated to find out that the survival rate of ovarian cancer was half of that of breast cancer. Oh, thank you, Jenny. Thank you so much. When I insisted on a prognosis, which was less than two years, I totally freaked out. So I'm driving out of the hospital grounds the last time. Physically, I'm feel really wrecked, but I'm very pleased to be going home. Ovarian cancer is what's classified as a less common cancer. Rare and less common cancers account for 50% of the cancers, but they only get 12% of the funding. That's like red rag to a bull to somebody like me. I thought, bugger that, I need to get to the bottom of why was that the case? It's all down to money, really, because ovarian cancer is so unsexy. And because it's unsexy, for some crazy reason, it means like mums like mine are going to die. I'm just the busiest I've ever been in my entire life. Yeah, but you are organised. You strike me as being yeah. quite organised. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A big motivating factor for Jill has been her daughter and wanting to make a difference for her and her generation. So many layers, honey. It's there, are very, there are many layers. Yeah. Malia's in her early 20s. She now has an increased chance of having this disease because of me. That's just terrible. As a mother, that's horrible. Soon after Jill had the first phase of treatment, she was diving into looking at the research and she connected up with Professor Nicola Bowden. What was amazing about Nicola's story is that local winemakers, Faye and Brian McGuigan, 
had given a multi-million dollar donation to keep her team going doing ovarian cancer research. Yeah, so these ones are replicating. We don't have very many big teams in Australia that work on ovarian cancer. There's a lot more philanthropic funding for breast cancer. Hello. Great to see you again. Thank you for coming here. Oh. Well, good to see you. Nicola really reinforced what I'd read. There has been huge funding inequity. Looks like a new young person in there. It is. Josh is working on treating ovarian cancer cells. Yeah. With some we have a project working on an early detection test so that the general population will be screened to see if they have ovarian cancer cells in their blood. For research, the screening test is the number one thing. That's the biggest hole that we have. There is no general population screening test. There's a lot of misinformation that women think that a pap smear will cover everything down there. It doesn't. Nicola's work is largely about repurposing chemotherapy drugs. She's going to try drugs that might keep us alive long enough to get on the new trials of drugs coming through, like the big immunotherapy drugs. So that just keeps us going. Yeah. yeah it started with. We decided that we needed to use the passion that we both had for these things together to, to raise awareness around ovarian cancer. When Jill had the diagnosis and had to stop work, it was a really sad thing. But then when she got into her advocacy, it was an ability for her to get away from the gravity of her diagnosis. And I thought, maybe I want to make a podcast. I'd been on the radio for years. Surely there's a connection there. I interviewed the doctors that had operated on me and looked after me, other women who'd had ovarian cancer and we made a thing called Still Jill. This is episode three. I know when it comes to a relapse with ovarian cancer that when it comes back, it's incurable. I brought people into my world, into my heart, into my head, into my terror about this disease. Welcome to a very special hour of radio. Welcome to, to our live audience. Give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> Fabulous to see you all here. Now, Jill, straight to it. Why are we here? And we had a launch here at Newcastle, a live broadcast about the podcast. A good mate even gave me a recorder for my birthday and said, come on, Emerson, get on with it, start recording. And I think it helped really propel it into the community, certainly here in The Hunter, in a way that we might not have been able to achieve had we just put out a press release. I woke up one morning in September of 2017 with a splitting headache. I'd finished my first round of chemotherapy. I got up, but I fell back down to the floor, taking the curtains with me, and something was wrong. I was shocked, I knew she was, had been unwell, but she was on the ground and couldn't get up. And I knew something serious was going on, so I called the ambulance. The cancer metastasized to my brain and I had emergency surgery. If it had have been there for another day longer in my brain, I would have been dead. The reality of her having a brain tumour meant that her prognosis was now way worse. And that was a long night for me, um, thinking about her, thinking about the future. When I woke up from the surgery, I looked at this man and I went to myself, you saved my life. And I actually had a dream that I was in a hippie skirt and we were getting married. So I asked him to marry me. I was um, quite amused to hear it, but then I sort of had to step back and say, well, what do I do with this? Being a doctor, he said, Jill, it'd be unethical of me to say yes straight away while you're under the influence of drugs. Let's come back to this in a week or two and see whether you're still serious. And we did, and we are, and I can't believe it. I, Jill Bernadette Tarley Emerson, Take you, Kenneth David Lambert. Take you, Kenneth David Lambert. To be my husband. To be my husband. 
in sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. So long as we both shall live. So long as we both shall live. I now declare them to be husband and wife. The wedding was an extraordinary celebration. Jill has always had bucket loads of courage, so this wedding was an amazing statement. And it was a declaration, not only of her love for Ken, but of who she is. Ultimately, it's the Minister for Health that holds the big purse strings. So I made a point of securing an interview with him for the podcast, and I wanted to try and push him to, if he hadn't already thought of giving extra money to ovarian cancer, to please think about it. We are at a point where we could have a great leap forward with some really targeted funding. My hope is that the researchers will put forward ovarian cancer projects. By telling Jill's story, she has been able to shed light on the condition. How do we get that earlier? Despite the burden of what she's carrying, she has an optimism and she has a personality that shines through. Good luck tonight. Yeah. It's going to be a hard day, but you know what? You don't have to hide your emotions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I bought waterproof mascara. <laughs> I felt happy with the response that I got from the Minister for Health, and then I felt I was able to build on that when I went to speak at the National Press Club. I presented with Jill at the Press Club, and it was broadcast live right around the nation. There was not a dry eye in the house. I have a 22-year-old daughter. I hate the suffering that she now bears. Let's aim to see ovarian cancer survival rate double from today's 44% to 90%. Why not? If we did it for breasts, we can do it for our ovaries too. When Jill first discussed the funding inequity, my initial reaction was, as somebody who has had breast cancer, you have to be really careful. You know, there is no cure for breast cancer. It does still need research funding. The next important question is, why did we stop at our breasts? My initial instinct was that it wasn't a good road to go down, but she did, and she's turned it into something that is a, a cause that you can rally behind because it's right. Our ovaries deserve nothing less. Thank you very much. I knew I was treading on delicate ground. Of course, breast cancer does still kill women, but 91% survive. I don't begrudge women with breast cancer, that fantastic result. I just think it's pretty close to outrageous and a scandal that we can't do better for women with ovarian cancer. You loved that trip because you met all these cousins. Yeah, they were all my age. That you didn't know you had. Yeah. I'm very aware that my daughter Malia and I need to program times together because my time might be short. Oh, I want to go back to summer. Yeah, you while. haven't been for a while. I spend a lot of time in denial. It's sad to see someone who's worked so hard her whole life to be where she is and to have it taken away from her. I mean, look at this poor owl. Your grandmother. For her to decide to really open up publicly yeah, it's hard. I went back to Canberra in 2019 to be the keynote speaker at the Ovarian Cancer Awareness Month launch. That was a huge event. The Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, was there. Greg Hunt was there. Lots of ministers were there. This is an insidious disease. It has the lowest survival rate of any woman's cancer in Australia, as we've heard. 
Now, I'm not a beggar, and I hate coming here begging for your support. And Prime Minister, I'd like to thank you for the support that you have shown us. But I just need you to know that all of the women like me, we actually feel that we are on our knees in trying to advance this cancer. And fundamentally, that means we need significant sums of money. Jill's speech was particularly powerful. It helped to create an environment where we realised that as much as we'd done, there was the potential to do more. It helped form the case for the additional 20 million for early diagnosis, better treatment. So there has been an announcement made of $20 million to go into the research around ovarian cancer. And the timing of that, it's the Jill impact. I mean, that is incredibly heartening if I've made a difference there, because $20 million is small by many cancer indicators, but for ovarian, it's phenomenal. We're all veins, they've been through the mill. Remember we got blocked last time? Yeah. I was really sick, so much so that we thought my days were numbered. You're going in deep. And then I was really lucky to get a place on an immunotherapy drug trial just when the traditional medicine, the chemotherapy, had stopped working for me. So this is specifically named drug only, so it's named and made up just for you. What the immunotherapy does is it enhances the body's immune system in the hope that the body's own immune system recognises the cancer as something foreign and then attacks it. And if you feel anything that doesn't feel right, you need to let me know. Mm -hmm. I'll keep my eye on you. OK. All right. As her husband, I really want it to work. With my doctor hat on and being a realist about this being an early phase experimental trial, I can't get my hopes too high. this trial will give me my life back, will put my cancer into remission and allow me to live. Yeah, we needed that extra thing. <laughs> it's like I've come kind of back from the precipice of death. All right, yeah. So the feeling of relief in my family, my friends is profound. Who's ready for a barbecue? Hands up! I think Ooh. Lee is. Well, I'm going to eat all your sausages. <laughs> Yes, I am. I think every woman in my position should be demanding of their oncologist to get them on a trial, to find one. Everybody, Hi. Jill. Lovely, happy Sunday. Jeez, happy Yay. Sunday. <laughs> I've got friends who are in remission on these new drugs, so maybe that could be me. Did you find a ant? What is magic about mum being this well is that I have been blessed to still have this time where she's my mother. So mum and I can keep trying to fight the fight. <laughs>